so good evening everyone so we are here again for third yes, yes we are here again for the third session of william hazlitt's work characters of shakespeare's play in the last day of our discussion we concluded with the paragraph Now, if I read this paragraph, the moral perfection of this character has been called in question. We think by those who did not understand it, it is more interesting than, according to rules, amiable though not faultless, the ethical delineations of that noble and liberal casuist, as Shakespeare has been well called, do not exhibit the drab-colored Quakerism of morality. His plays are not copied either from the whole duty of man. or from the academy of compliments we confess we are a little shocked at the want of refinement in those who are shocked at the want of refinement in hamlet so such an open analysis of shakespeare's morality what hasgit wants to say is that there is no conservatism in shakespeare's approach to morality it does not belong to that school of morality and what he does is to explore different socio political situations in which the morality and ethics play their role we confess we are uh, a little shocked at the want of refinement in those who are shocked at the want of refinement in hamlet the neglect of punctilious exactness in his behavior either partakes of the license of the time or else belongs to the very excess of intellectual refinement in the character which makes the common rules of life as well as his own purposes sit loose upon him he may be said to be amenable only to the tribunal of his own thoughts and is too much taken up with the airy world of contemplation to lay as much stress as the oath on the practical consequence of things the famous soliloquy of hamlet we remember talks about these two worlds of extremities the world of airy contemplation exposes hamlet to doubt and faith to a state of doubt and faith and he vacillates in between the two so on the one hand he doubts whether he is capable enough to take up arms against the sea of trouble and by opposing end it on the other hand there is an urgency in hamlet's mind to execute the action that is before him that is the revenge so he has to take up arms and he had to be he has to be practical so he keeps on thinking contemplating meditating upon the two extremities of thought whether it is feasible for him to take the action ahead or to just step back wait procrastinate so procrastinate is uh, a kind of verb that refers to the delay in action there is no semblance between hamlet's thought and action okay there is a split and he is a character who keeps on thinking consistently and his thought process is inconsistent and therefore being consistently inconsistent he keeps on delaying the act of revenge so this is a state of perpetual limbo a state of stasis so he stands in this cartesian axiomatic point of immobility and inaction so whether he should take the vertical or the horizontal axiomatic direction he is not he is not prepared and he keeps on contemplating on the consequence of action so he takes the cause and effect relationship into account 
throughout his meditation or contemplation on the subject so whether to take up arms or just suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune in romantic criticism therefore hamlet is not situated in a plot but is caught in the plot of his mind he is not situated in a sequence of action rather the sequence of action is located within his mind his habitual principles as has been says writes his habitual principles of actions are unhinged and out of joint with the time so the chronology of his action is blurred moves in a zigzag course not on a straight line and he keeps on taking say two steps ahead and then going back three steps that is his movement or he is returning back to the point the axiomatic point where the where the axis the vertical and the horizontal axis criss cross that is the axiomatic point of cartesian axis and he stays there in the zero zero condition in beckett's waiting for godo we have the trams waiting for godo so godo will come some day and then godo will solve the problem in a similar way hamlet is also waiting for something waiting for first father's ghost second waiting for few words from his mother words of consolation words of promise words that will guarantee guarantee him the reclamation of throne then he keeps on waiting for the fidelity truthfulness of love in ophelia he keeps on waiting for polonius's good advice that is more suitable for his plans to reclaim his entitled throne then he waits for the public confession of king claudius and therefore inserts an insert play the dumb show the murder of gonzago even after getting the evidence by catching the conscience of the king to the insert play he cannot execute the crime as has been has rightly pointed out because the man whom he has come to kill is praying to god he might reach heaven so here we have this hamlet waiting and once he commits a crime unwittingly in a wanton act he kills polonius he keeps on waiting to understand the nature of his act number one why did he kill polonius whose life he has promised to save why did he become a cause of ophelia's death whom he loved so much so even his escape to england also keeps him waiting for further evidence when he gets one especially the letter that he finds in which his name is written a name to be executed in england and replaces the name with the name of rosen prince and gildeston he has to wait returning home he has to gather enough material in order to support his rightful claim and to avenge the death of his father so throughout the play we find hamlet waiting for the opportune moment to convert his private revenge into a public one and execute his father's words so he must hear the words of his father protestant ethics speak about this we remember robinson crusoe defied his father's words went out and then met that shipwreck that led him to that isolated island where he lives for long 24 years so in the protestant ethics the words of father becomes very important and the words are to be kept in mind but hamlet has to solve his own problem the problem of his mind his renaissance education has taught that man is the paragon of animals the best the best person the god almost like a god pico mirandela talks about this creation of adam 
in the image of God. So angelic person. Hamlet regards this human being as an angelic creation. And yet he finds himself in a post Edenic false paradise, almost like a hell. So his principles, the Renaissance principles, the ideologies are, of course, not suitable for the time. The time that demands from him, demands from him action by keeping his uh, thought to execute the crime into hibernation. There is where Hamlet is placed in a perpetual limbo, a cast 22 position. And Hamlet keeps on procrastinating, staying in that position for a long time. Even his conduct, according to Hazlitt, to Ophelia is quite natural in his circumstances. So this is the naturalization of Hamlet's position by taking into account the situation of Hamlet. Hamlet is placed in a particular circumstance that does not allow Hamlet to have faith either in providence or in human beings. So it is quite natural in his circumstances to doubt Ophelia. His mother has married his uncle without waiting even for a month, without bewailing, without mourning. Gertrude has married King Claudius. So Ophelia becomes the object of this immense hatred or a sense of distrust. According to Hazlitt, his conduct to Ophelia is quite natural in his circumstances. So this is a way of reading the position of Hamlet in the text. T.S. Eliot, while commenting on Hamlet's position in the text, says that this is an artistic failure because Ophelia's viewpoint is not narrated by the writer. And only whatever we find in the play, we find it through the perspective of Hamlet. Here, Hazlitt does the same subjective blunder, a kind of fallacy in understanding Hamlet's position. And he is reading Hamlet's character not through the eyes of Ophelia, but through the eyes of, of Hamlet. Thereby the inclination, the subjective inclination towards Hamlet makes this a lopsided reading of the character. Hazlitt continues, it is that of assumed severity only. It is the effect of disappointed hope of bitter regrets of affection suspended, not obliterated by the distractions of the scene around him. What are these distractions? The distractions around him are related to the infidelity, the betrayal, distrust generated by Gertrude, his mother. Amidst the natural and preternatural horrors of his situation, he might be excused in delicacy from carrying on a regular court ship. So this sterility of Hamlet is read by Hazlitt as a sequence, as a consequence of the position in which he is placed. Therefore, he justifies Hamlet's position in the play. Seen from the perspective of Ophelia or Gertrude, we find that this is almost lopsided in favor of the male viewpoint, male gaze. Shakespeare being a male writer, Hamlet being a male character. Of course, the feminist critics will accuse this analysis of the characters of Hamlet as favoring the masculine gaze, the male gaze, looking at the female as object, as passive beings on whom things are done. So Hamlet's response to these two characters in the play is guided by his own impression about them. He does not give them suitable opportunity to express their viewpoints. Amidst the natural and preternatural horrors of a situation, he might be excused in delicacy from carrying on a regular courtship. 
even this is justified by Hazlitt. When his father's spirit was in arms, it was not a time for a son to make love in. So he says that the job of Hamlet is to execute the task of revenge. And this time of revenge is not suitable for any kind of love relationship. So he could ni neither marry Ophelia nor wound her mind by explaining the cause of his alienation, which he just hardly trust himself to think of. It would have taken him years to have come to a direct explanation of the point. In the harassed state of mind, he could not have done much otherwise than he did. His conduct does not contradict what he says when he sees her funeral. We remember this section where Hamlet spies on the funeral of Ophelia, who has died by drowning, buried herself in the water, pining for love, pining for her lost father, whose body has been buried secretly by Hamlet and King Claudius. So he challenges this when the burial is taking place. He comes in the scene trying to assert his love for Ophelia. How does he assert this? He even enters the grave sharing the space and says, I loved Ophelia. 40,000 brothers could not with all their quantity of love make up my sum. Shakespeare was an expert in hyperboles. Dr. Johnson might find fault in this use of such hyperbolic expression that defies the logic on which the entire neoclassical criticism was based. And here we have Hamlet speaking in hyperbolic terms his love for Ophelia. Very important lines in the text. So where was this love when Ophelia was pining in hope, waiting in patience, with patience for the reciprocation of Hamlet's love? When Ophelia is planted by Polonius and Claudius to spy on Hamlet's activities in order to know what is going on in his mind, and Hamlet suspects the role of Ophelia. Where was this love for Ophelia? He never, in the play, explains his position to Ophelia. And Ophelia keeps guessing on Hamlet's strange manners without fully understanding what is the cause of his real suffering. So this expression of love in extremity also shows Hamlet capable of, capable of cherishing such strong passions. Towards the end, after the waiting is end, we have this dual scene where we have a full expression of his youthful energy where he can execute any kind of action by determination and will. His action is, of course, heroic at that moment. But for, where was this heroism in romance lost when he was unable to see the predicament of Ophelia? Yeah, someone can read. So we begin uh, with the next paragraph. Can someone read the next paragraph? Yes, Ayesha. Yes, sir. From where I, I should read? Shakespeare was thoroughly. Nothing can be more. Nothing can be more affecting. Yeah. Just a second, sir. So nothing can be more affecting. Nothing can be more affecting or beautiful than the Queen's apostrophe to Ophelia on throwing the flowers into the grave. Sweets to the sweet, farewell. I hope thou shouldest, shouldest have been my Hamlet's wife. I thought thy bright bed to have digged, sweet mate, and not have strewed thy grave. Shakespeare was thoroughly a master of the mixed motives of a human character, and he here sues us uh, the queen, who was so criminal in some respects, not without sensibility and affection in other relations of life. 
Ophelia is a character almost too exquisitely touching to be dealt upon, dwelt upon. O rose of May, O flower too soon faded. Her love, her madness, her death are described with the truest touches of tenderness and pathos. It is a character which nobody but Shakespeare could have drawn in the way that he has done, and to the conception of which there is not even the smallest approach, except in, except in some of the old romantic ballads. Her brother, um, Laertes, is a character we do not like so well. He is too hot and choleric, and somewhat. Uh, Rodmontare. Okay. Okay. Polonius is a perfect character in its kind. Nor is there nor is there any foundation for the objections which have made to the consistency of this part. It is said that he acts very foolishly and talks very sensibly. There is no inconsistency in that. Again, that he talks wisely at one time and foolishly at another. Uh, that his advice to Laertes is very excellent, yeah. and his advice to the king and and queen on the subject of Hamlet's madness is very ridiculous. But he gives one as a father and is sincere in it. He gives the other as a mere courtier, a busybody, and is accordingly officious, garrulous, and impertinent. In short, Shakespeare has been accused of. Inconsistency in this and other characters only because he has kept up the distinction, which only be, he has kept up, uh, kept up the distinction which there is in nature between the understanding and the moral habits of men, between the absurdity of their ideas and the absurdity of their motives. Polonial is not a fool, but he makes himself so. His folly, whether in his actions or speeches, comes under the head of. Impropriety of intention. Thank you, Aisha, for your excellent reading. So here we have few more characters from Hamlet, and we can see the bias that Hazlitt has towards Hamlet, while he's appreciating Shakespeare for the mastery of representing human characters, and was thoroughly a master of mixed motives of human characters. We find that his appreciation of Hamlet vis a vis his depreciation of the characters like Laertes, Ophelia's brother, and of Polonius, turn contradictory. So, here, even the queen, he shows the queen who was so criminal in some respects, not without sensibility and affection in other relations of life. But when he is talking about Ophelia, Ophelia is also. Appreciated and regarded as a very soft, feminine, touchingly real character. But here, even this admiration for two female characters in the play is lopsided in favor of Hamlet. So her love, her madness, her death are described with the truest touches of tenderness and pathos. So this is a misreading of the character of Ophelia. While he can understand, Hazlitt can understand the pain of Hamlet, he hardly understands the pain and pathos of Gertrude and Ophelia. So this makes this essay lopsided in favor of the male gaze, male reading of the text. So here, the passivity of Ophelia and Gertrude is seen as uh, a mark of Shakespeare's greatness. Okay, so feminist critics will say, no, this is not a mark of Shakespeare's greatness because the objective correlative in presenting the female characters has not been maintained by Shakespeare. The viewpoint of Gertrude and Ophelia is not stated. They are simply characters on whom Hamlet does things. They remain passive throughout. So her love, her madness, her death, as it says, presented with truest touches of tenderness and pathos. But we find that this is not right 
appreciation of Shakespeare's representation of the female characters. Shakespeare's, according to Jonathan Dolimo, usually has presented the female characters standing almost on an equal platform with the male counterparts in an otherwise patriarchal society. So this can be seen in the comedies, comedies like As You Like It, where we have Rosalind, Merchant of Venice, where we have Portia, or Twelfth Night, where we have Viola, standing almost on an equal platform with the male counterparts. But remember, they are all the prime movers of the play. They are the actors. Okay, not the passive recipient of action. So unlike Ophelia and Gertrude, the triumphant heroines of Shakespearean comedy, they are more active. The passivity, on the other hand, of Ophelia and Gertrude has been appreciated by Hazlitt. And this appreciation is in favor of Shakespeare. Hazlitt even says that it is a character which nobody Shakespeare could have drawn in a way that he has done. done. So do we support this viewpoint? Virginia Woolf will definitely say no. Most of the works are written on women and mostly by men. And whenever the men wrote the female, they wrote it wrongly. And definitely Hazlitt was on the male party, writing or rewriting, critiquing the representation of female in the work of Shakespeare. And the same male prejudice, pride, is prevalent in this expression. So he appreciates Shakespeare and says that Shakespeare has drawn the characters in such a way no other writers could have done. But see the plays, plays of, say, John Webster, where we have Duchess of Malfi. The White Devil, where we have Vittoria Corombona. The way Webster has presented the female characters, taking up arms against a sea of trouble by opposing anything. But the activity of these female characters on the Jacobian stage, even Lady Macbeth in Macbeth, or Cleopatra in Antony and Cleopatra is replaced by a sheer passivity in the characters of Gertrude and Ophelia. And yet Hazlitt appreciates Shakespeare's portrayal of these female characters. So Hazlitt talks about this conception on which there is not even the smallest approach except in some old romantic ballads. So highly, highly exaggerated hyperbolic representation, appreciation of Shakespeare. They are seen as, uh, as the puppets in the hand of destiny. Even in these romantic ballads that talk about love, loss, betrayal, separation. We have adequate representation of the female mind. But here we have only the male mind that is presented. Now coming to the other male characters of the play, say the secondary characters whom we call secondary with reference to the primary hero, central character, protagonist, Hamlet. So Leritus. Leritus is a character we do not like so well. What is the reason? So Leritus in this play has done no wrong. Has done no wrong. Being the son of Polonius, he is also orphaned. Polonius is killed by a person, Hamlet. And Claudius will definitely be using the situation to provoke Leritus to commit the act of revenge, to commit the crime against Hamlet. Claudius uses Leritus as a tool villain, but also a revenger, avenger. So he's a character whom we must admire because he is situated in a position where he has to depend on the words of Claudius, the news that he has given him, and he has to take revenge. So two sons are there, Hamlet and Leritus. Both have lost their fathers. Hamlet procrastinates because he has to convert his personal information given to him by his 
father's ghost into a public evidence to execute the crime revenge similarly leritus has been told by a person living king claudius about the crime committed against his father by hamlet so both have enough reason to execute revenge and serve the task in classical greek plays also we have this when in aeschylus's play orestes returns and finds that his father has been killed by his mother clytemnestra he is also provoked to avenge the death of his father but in order to do that he has to he has to commit patricide orestes does this when orestes comes in the shape of hamlet in shakespeare's play this orestes the danish orestes procrastinates and the other levitis who comes here he has no scruples in his mind when he has found evidence about the crime and he knows how to execute the act of revenge he takes up arms and wants to plans to kill leritus kill hamlet even though leritus has that similar renaissance upbringing he is the son of polonius polonius is the wisest person in this play and leritus being the son of polonius has this this renaissance values on the virtue of man the morality and ethics so he even reconciles and says that in order to vent out his anger against hamlet he will be participating in a duel in a fight sword fight with hamlet without knowing that claudius has planned otherwise claudius has planned to kill hamlet by poisoning the sword of leritus so this friendly fight between hamlet and leritus which leritus thinks will somehow purge his own guilt of not being able to avenge the death of his father and show on the battlefield all the concocted one his valor his purpose he has accepted that hamlet has done this unwittingly leritus has accepted that hamlet's crime is a crime in ignorance and therefore he can pardon hamlet such is his character but has it fails to understand this shade of his character and simply says that he is too hot and choleric and someone rodomon that day so the question is why does hazrit say so so the textual reading of the play is missing and he is swayed by the representation of hamlet on the stage so in the text there are enough evidence there is enough evidence that talk about the contrary state of leritus leritus is also a seasoned man a man well trained but his robust energy hot and choleric nature that is there in leritus has been has been instigated by king claudius and has it fails to understand this so in this political play we have claudius working on leritus mind and converting this good man in the public view into a villain and has it ironically has read or taken the side of claudius while reading leritus on the other hand polonius is also not perfectly presented so polonius is almost a choric character in the play a shock absorber so he is a person who belongs to hamlet's party fully knowing it and yet he is also a minister so his task is to minister the situation instill hope and courage in hamlet bring hamlet back to a state of normal being and here again we have a misreading of the character of polonius romantic criticism often has this tendency of misreading characters although it has of course definitely read some of the characters in a new light as colrus has read say malvolio's character in a new light but this new insight into one character does not mean that insight into other character be lost here we have polonius presented as a perfect character in his kind 
nor is there any foundation for the objections which have been made to the consistency of his part so he has to support the king he has to support hamlet but here this statement he acts very foolishly and talks very sensibly see how interesting this contradiction has been pointed out by hazlet so even while representing polonius in favor of shakespeare he has highlighted the contradiction that is there in the character of polonius a person who talks sensibly acts foolishly and thinks wisely that is the character of polonius and hazlitt does not found, find any kind of inconsistency even in this contradiction so he is seen as a person who can give wise advice who can give foolish advice so his advice to lelitus is seen as very excellent advice to king and queen on the subject of hamlet's madness according to hazlitt is ridiculous what polonius does in the play is to help hamlet come out of his madness come out of his situation so he is absorbed in his thought polonius wants to help king claudius to read the mind of hamlet and even supports the act of planting ophelia to understand the mind of hamlet so there are multiple shades in the character of polonius polonius is also presented by hazlitt as a complex character he says that he gives the uh, one as a father and is sincere in it he gives the other as a mere courtier a busy body and is accordingly officious garrulous impertinent so no other critic has thought about polonius in such a way most of the critics before romantic criticism came polonius was regarded as a person a wise fool in the play a person who knows everything so almost like the wise fools in other plays of shakespeare especially in king lear the fool sticks to king lear even at the state of his worst misery like that polonius also sticks to the state as well as sticks to hamlet and politically tries to balance both unfortunately he is killed killed by hamlet hamlet says a rat a rat stabs this man hiding behind the arrow hazlitt says that shakespeare has been accused of inconsistency in this and other characters only because again appreciation of shakespeare only because he has kept up the distinction which there is in nature between the understanding and the moral habits of men between the absurdities of their ideas and the absurdities of their motive so polonius is therefore part pardoned because of this so he is not a fool but makes himself so his folly whether in his action or in speeches comes under the head of impropriety of intention i do disagree with has this view so polonius is neither a fool nor does he make himself a fool although he plays the role of a fool in this play hamlet characters keep on playing roles and the play depends much on the discrepancy between what the player thinks and what the player does on the stage so every player is performing selves on the stage so hamlet also thinks madness hamlet thinks madness polonius is also playing the fool because that is his role in the play he has been an instructor a guide almost a parental figure father figure to hamlet and in order to rejoice in order to re regale hamlet he keeps on playing the role of a fool but this is not a folly so he is a wise fool he does not wear the motley of a fool you remember feste telling that i do not wear the motley in my brain polonius is such a character who does not wear the motley the garb of a fool in his brain he is a wise man and whose wisdom keeps on keeps on performing on the stage through his action so whatever he does in the play is to safeguard the interest both of hamlet as well as of the king king claudius it does want to create any kind of situation that will lead to conflict varying factions and to perform his role as a courtier 
to balance opposites. So placed in a situation where he has a revenging son and a criminal uncle set together on the same stage. What is his task? His task is to balance, harmonize these and affect some kind of reconciliation. So he can negotiate with either Gertrude or Claudius in order to provide some space for Hamlet so that Hamlet can become the future king of Denmark. And even King Claudius promises this. Gertrude also asserts this, that whoever is the king now, the throne is kept for Hamlet and someday or the other Hamlet will become the king of Denmark. That is his task. But this is not absurd. Neither is his ideas absurd, nor is his motive contradictory. Although he is killed in this battle unwittingly by Hamlet. So we come towards the uh, end of the essay. Next paragraph. Yes. Who will read the next paragraph? Sudeshna, Shagufta, anyone? Sir, sir, me. Yes, yes, start reading. Very good. Yes, from this section, we do not. Yes, you can see this on the screen. We do not like to see our authors. Please start reading. Yes, sir. We do not like to see our author's plays acted and, and least of all Hamlet. There is no play that suffers so much in being transfer, transferred to the stage. Hamlet himself seems hardly capable of being acted. Mr. Very important comment. Hamlet himself seems hardly capable of being acted. So this is character Hamlet or the play Hamlet or both? Both. Okay. Sir, character Hamlet. Okay. Okay. Come on. Read. Campbell, Ca Campbell unavoidably fails in this character from, from a want of ease and variety. The character of Hamlet is made up of undulating lines. It has the yielding flexibility of a wave to the sea. Mr. Campbell plays it like a man in armor with a determined inveteracy of purpose in one undevi undeviating straight line, which as remote from the natural grace and refined susceptibility of the character. As the sharp angels, as the sharp angels, and abrupt, abrupt, as the sharp angles, and angles abrupt. and abrupt starts, which Mr. Keen introduces into the ab part. Mr. Keen's Hamlet is as much too splenetic and rash as Mr. Campbell's is too deliberate and formal. His manner is too strong and pointed. He throws a se severity approaching to virulence into the common observations and answers. There is nothing of this in Hamlet. He is, as it were, wrapped up in his reflections and only thinks aloud. There should therefore be no attempt to impress what he sees upon others by a studied exaggeration of emphasis or manner no talking at this hearers there should be as much of the gentleman and scholar as possible in infused into the path and as little of the actor a pensive air of sadness and sorry should sit reluctantly upon his bow bro but no appearance of fixed and sullen gloom. He is full of weakness and melancholy, but there is no harness, sorry, harness 
in his nature he is the most there is no harshness in his nature in his nature he is the most amiable of misanthropes thank you excellent reading so we come to a new form of thank criticism you, so here thank we find a new form of criticism what type of criticism is this within romantic criticism we have this type of criticism is it audience response so from the point of view of an audience we have a review of this enactment of 1816 hamlet where we have kimble performing the role okay so audience response most of the criticism up to the romantic period are oriented towards the act of performance and theater criticism was more or less based on such performances only during the neoclassical period we do have some amount of shakespeare scholarship based on the text reading of shakespeare because most of the editors of shakespeare like alexander pope joseph addison dr samuel johnson they wrote a lot about shakespeare's plays with reference to the printed text but apart from these new classical critics who are also the editors of shakespeare most of shakespearean criticism up to that time was based on the performance of shakespeare on the stage some important aspects of romantic criticism of shakespearean performance so we have this appreciation of shakespeare based on at least two aspects number one whether the stage representation of shakespeare is possible at all or not and number two whether the representation of the character or the play through the act of acting is able to transport the readers into the textual world of shakespeare into the poetic world of shakespeare shakespeare's plays are seen as poetic dramas psychological plays poetry and psychology both are contrary to the stage and romantic criticism try to highlight this that poetry and the psychological insight into the character both cannot coexist with this artificial way of representing the character through the mode of acting with such powerful actors like mr kembel on the stage we have the response of the romantic critics from the auditorial or audience view point lopsided again and extremely subjective so they are expecting from the stage production of the play much more which the actor or the player usually fail so he first says that we do not like to see our authors play acted and least of all hamlet interesting comment would you subscribe to this view of hazlet plays a thing which will help us to catch the conscience of the actor the character but hazlet on the other hand says no it is not possible to read hamlet we so we understand hamlet with reference to the visual representation of hamlet on the stage so romantic criticism must must of uh, charles lamb coleridge their romantic criticism always talk about this impossibility of enactment of shakespeare's plays on the stage shakespeare's play on the stage had usually taken two modes of representation during the romantic period one was definitely the the new classical form of representation the baroque stage properties were used with artificial paintings and properties on the stage and it was almost realistically represented since the restoration period on the stage so shakespeare the poet of nature the poet of the theater that was more suitable for the elizabethan and jacobean audience especially the open theater was put into the baroque theater with the artificial rectangular box like structure of the new classical post new classical stage romantic critics find fault in this realistic portrayal of shakespeare and find that no this is not possible shakespeare being too large for the stage especially his representation of nature 
poetry, character, these cannot be accommodated within this rectangular box-like space that the Baroque theater, the contemporary proscenium theater, the curtain theater offered. The second form of representing Shakespeare during that period that developed following the new movements in art, especially the paintings of Henry Fuseli that promoted romantic imagination and the state of mind, consciousness in the canvas also led to the representation of this on the stage. And we have, yes, we have some good presentation on the stage, especially the representation of the psychology of character with reference to the environment in a highly romantic manner, where the dream, conscious, subconscious, all these come together in the interplay and the character has to be enacted on the stage, keeping in mind these psychological aspects. Of course, the romantic poets also wrote some good characters for the stage, like Chenchi, the Chenchi in Shelley's work, or Manfred in Byron, or say Prometheus Unbound. So we have such characters, quasi-mythical poetic characters on the stage of the romantic period. Shakespeare was being appropriated to that form of representation. And Kemble was an actor par excellence who was capable of providing enough materials for such an acting of performance of Shakespeare. But he belonged to the realistic mold that developed in the European theater since the restoration. So that neoclassical Baroque theater representation of Shakespeare was prevalent during that period. So here we have Hazlitt clearly stating that such a representation of Hamlet is a failure. So Hamlet is a theatrical failure, keeping in mind the stage machinery of the Romantic period. And he says that Shakespeare's plays should not be acted on the stage. And Hamlet, according to Hazlitt, is the least actable play of Shakespeare. He also says that there is no play that suffers so much in being transferred to the stage. What can be the possible reason? Yeah, the possible reason is the length of the soliloquies of Hamlet. Most of the plays that we find, except Hamlet, have more action. Hazlitt also fails to realize that Hamlet is also a play full of action. Almost all the theatrical devices of the Elizabethan Jacobian theater have been fully explored and used by Shakespeare in this play, Hamlet. So we have all the masala that was popular during the Elizabethan Jacobian period that we find in Hamlet. And interesting, Hamlet is the most successful Elizabethan Jacobian play on the stage, on the public theater. So why is Hazlitt talking just the opposite, that Shakespeare's plays are unactable, non-actable. And he regards Hamlet as the most unactable of plays of Shakespeare. So our new historicist reading, situating the text in the context of the Elizabethan and Jacobian period, prove the contrary, where we find Hamlet, Dr. Foster's Spanish tragedy, these being the most successful plays performed during that period. So why is Hazlitt saying that this is a play that cannot be acted? Was it because of the changing properties of the stage, changing condition, performative circumstances? The old Elizabethan and Jacobian theater architecture has changed, has been replaced by a new, more realistic rectangular box-like representation. Is Shakespeare too loud for this type of stage? is his poetry of nature is impossible to be confined within the within the artificial box-like structure of neoclassical theater. But Hazlitt is not talking about that. He is not talking about performance of Shakespeare with reference to the theater architecture, performative circumstances, or the audience response. He's talking in terms of the content in the play. So their soliloquies are too long, yes. Hamlet keeps on talking. This 30,000 word play, Hamlet, has 
more words, words, words given in the mouth of Hamlet. And once that is transformed on the stage, what happens? The ironies that are there, the subtle ironies that gradually reveal the character of Hamlet go missing. Was it because, because of uh, bad acting of Mr. Campbell? I won't agree to that because Mr. Campbell was a good actor, was a reputed actor and could read the characters much more, much more intelligently being an actor, a performer, more intelligently than Hazlitt. What Hazlitt is searching in such stage representation of Hamlet is poetry, is the psychology of character. So we depend on the psychological reading of the character on the stage. So character comes and goes and there is hardly any time to speculate on the character when we are actually watching the stage play. Rapid action. Okay, in Hamlet, we have rapid action. Even when he is delivering his soliloquy, there is, of course, an action. Hide and seek games are going on throughout. When he is delivering soliloquies, either there is a person hiding behind the arrows or behind the screen, listening to what he is saying. Or there is some kind of monologues that are there. Even when he is talking philosophy, he is talking it aloud. He is trying to dispute with himself in order to resolve the problems. Elizabethan and Jacobin audience could easily relate to Hamlet's dilemma. Why is it that Hazlitt is saying that Hamlet's dilemma cannot be acted on the stage? So Hamlet himself hardly capable of being acted. Hamlet as a play, Hamlet as a character, says Hazlitt is not capable of being acted on the stage. Then he goes on to appreciate Mr. Campbell. So he's trying to balance. Mr. Campbell unavoidably fails in his character from a want of ease and variety. So there is some kind of mundane morbidity in the character of Hamlet. Because Hamlet is speaking a lot in the stage. But he also does action. And some of these actions are harsh, rash, sudden. So in a split of in a split of second, he is performing some action. But according to Hazlitt, Campbell is, Campbell is unable to represent Hamlet's character with ease and variety. I remember Lawrence Oliver's reading and presentation of Hamlet's character. So he internalizes the character of Hamlet and performs the mind of Hamlet in a most poetic manner in his production of Shakespeare's Hamlet. Campbell must have tried out I have not seen the performance. I have read some comments on Campbell's performance and I'm convinced that Hamble, Campbell tried to represent the psychological nature of Hamlet's dilemma. According to Hazlitt, this is missing because character is made up of undulating lines. It has the yielding flexibility of a wave of the sea. So he plays like a man in armor. So much more externalized action is seen in Campbell's acting, according to Hazlitt. The interior mind of Hamlet is not much revealed through this operatic acting, according to, Hamlet, according to Hazlitt. So he says that the sharp edges of the character, angles of the character, inside of the character, these are all missing in the representation of the character of Hamlet in Keane's acting. Mr. Keane's Hamlet is as much too splenetic and rash as Mr. Kimball is too deliberate and formal. It's interesting. So he's reading Shakespeare's Hamlet in the true light. Hamlet is, himself is a combination of these two. I said slow thought, long soliloquies, mass with sudden rash action. That is what Hamlet is all about. And Hamlet's character represented by Keane must have been a good reading of Hamlet's character. But on the stage, it might not have succeeded, especially as this reading of Hamlet differs from Campbell's representation of Hamlet. So Hazlitt says that the representation is too rash, too strong, too pointed. 
and there is a civility in the representation that should be missing so he is delicate hamlet is a delicate hamlet is more aerial than it he is more ethereal than earthly so hazlitt says that the severity of approaching to violence into a common observation and answers so this this is not there in hamlet so hamlet only thinks aloud okay hamlet only thinks aloud but hamlet does not act aloud what campbell does in order to make the think king visible to the audience must have acted aloud so the acting must have been melodramatic operatic loud acting and this loud acting has been rejected so this loud acting is not required in cinematic version where we have the visual narrative working but on the theater loud acting can only represent a person thinking aloud especially the characters who develop their character through this act of soliloquy so soliloquy is a device and has it is unable to understand the importance of this device that requires thinking aloud by acting aloud so we have this type of readers response vis a vis audience response had it been readers or response to hamlet our understanding of hamlet might have differed but rather this is a kind of audience response to the performance of hamlet so if you try to convert the word into flesh that the theater does of course the text that is meant for reading is converted to text for performance and the representation depends on how the actor is interpreting the text and mr campbell's interpretation of hamlet and representation of hamlet on the stage has not been supported by hasbit so he says that there should be no attempt to impress what he says upon others by studied exaggeration not emphasis or manner no talking at his hearers but there are enough hints in the play where we have hamlet situated in a position where he has to speak aloud even his soliloquies so that the hearers can hear and always remember that audience audience in theater are also hearers in order to reach the audience without microphone you need to talk aloud even the even the secret mind has to be revealed in a loud manner so here we have a kind of reading of shakespeare this is the representation of shakespeare by mr kemble in has its say a pensive air of sadness should sit reluctantly upon his brow but no who has the time to look at the brow when the performance is there on the stage so there is no visualization or focalization on the brows of hamlet has it is expecting much more from an act of performance i said that theater is not cinema in cinema you can simply focalize on the brows of hamlet to reveal his character reveal his thought his dilemma that is not possible on the stage but hasbit is demanding much more because once again he is a romantic critic fascinated by the words shakespeare has written and wants an adequate representation of those words on the stage therefore he comes to the conclusion the inference is that he is full of weakness and melancholy but there is no harshness in nature he is the most amiable of misanthropes that is what his reading of character of shakespeare so character and the representation of shakespeare both are covered in this essay so if you have to summarize the essay what he should say like other essays on different characters of shakespeare we have an excellent reading of a character and has this impression of the thoughts of shakespeare's characters can be said to be genuine said to be subjective so whatever impression on the basis of performance or on the basis of the reading of the play is on the mind of hazlitt hazlitt represents that through this essays so although this was one first book of its kind that made a kind of holistic reading of the characters of shakespeare and his main focus is on the character that appear in the plays he also takes into account the performance of the characters on the stage he comments also on the play's dramatic structure 
and draws our attention to the poetry that is here, referring frequently to the commentary, even by the early critics. He also talks, interestingly, on the manner in which the characters were presented on the stage, acted on the stage. The essays, therefore, are very important as source materials for the study of Shakespeare, especially the evolution of Shakespeare through ages. So 32 plays that he covers, these essays and innumerable characters that are there in this play, in this uh, text, we have analysis of comedies, histories, tragedies, and the character appearing in those plays. Hasrit therefore comes to a kind of holistic reading of Shakespearean characters and talks about the richness and variety of Shakespearean plays with reference to his characters. While Dr. Johnson believed that every character in Shakespeare represents a type or species, Hazlitt, supporting the views of Alexander Pope, emphasizes the individuality of Shakespeare's character. This is an important aspect. Therefore, when we read the essay on Cymbeline or essay on Macbeth, we find the marked difference. He's not using the same way of reading the characters. So each character is seen individual. And only in Hamlet we find this, this representation of Hamlet, where we have the emphasis also on the possibility of performing Hamlet or the impossibility of performing Hamlet. But the variety is there. So he emphasized, like Alexander Pope, on the individuality of characters and has comprehensively discussed most of the characters of Shakespeare. Like the German contemporaries, I refer to the German writers like Schlegel, who drew our attention to the characters of Shakespeare's plays. So these works were available to, to the English readers during that period through translations. So we have this respect to the, to the psychology, the mind, the nature, the mysticism that is involved, although Hazlitt does not talk about this mysticism in the character that we find in Slegel's interpretation. Yet the enthusiasm for Shakespeare that was found lacking in the works of Dr. Johnson. Also, although Johnson also said that Shakespeare also was a poet of nature, but the enthusiasm for the, for the character, their mind, or the poetry that we find in the works of the romantic poets cannot be seen in the neoclassical criticism of Shakespeare. So genius of Shakespeare once again appreciated in the works with reference to the characters of Shakespeare. Thus we have in Hazard's essay a remarkable representation of Shakespeare's heroes and heroines, important characters. Even the minor characters are not ignored wholly by Hazlitt. So how can we conclude? We can conclude our reading of this essay with reference to the prose style that Hazlitt has used. We find that the prose style is very, very familiar, conversational, as if he's talking to the readers. As a periodical essay, this entire book was published as periodical essays and later on compiled in 1817 as a collection. So as a periodical essay, as an informal essay, as a personal essay, as well as as a literary essay, the essay combines different forms of romantic prose style. Romantic prose style is more conversational, does not have that inane phraseology or gaudiness of the neoclassical criticism. Although the writers use the prose in order to convey the states of mind, and there is a spontaneity in the language, the spontaneity is not, is not stopped by the rhetorics that we find in the neoclassical works. So language is not trite, it's not obscure, it's not complicated. Rather, it is 
more informal natural and spontaneous so the prose style of hazlitt is almost like charles lamb he has the ability to communicate with the audience a few difficult words are of course used because during that period there was a propensity among the writers to use such johnsonese such expressions that were made popular by dr johnson himself of stating things in a roundabout manner of using difficult jargonistic terms and especially in literature reviews we often find the use of such literary words but if you just take out those few words you find that this language is simple language really used by the readers and the conversational idiom the language of ordinary conversation the vocabulary that has been used all contribute to the clarity of thought contribute to the flair with which the thought is expressed through words so this is all about has this prose style among the romantic features we have seen that there are several romantic features that we find it has this work among such romantic features the most prominent is of course the subjective reading of the characters and the subjective reading also implies a kind of psychological reading so these are not the drab characters in the text of some dead writer but rather living embodiments who stroll on the romantic stage and whenever these characters are seen through the prism of romantic imagination they are humanized personified and then converted into a proper study of man alexander pope said that let not nature scan the proper study of mankind is man and yes we find in romantic criticism the proper study of mankind is a man who is living and the man that is there in the characters of shakespeare's play or the characters who live represent the nature of man so we have this subjectivity okay poetic way of representation the working of imagination the spontaneous spontaneity or spontaneous representation overflow of emotion feeling we also have a kind of inter connection with thought and proper way proper way through words to express the thoughts in the works of romantic poets so it is poetry written in the prose form that we find in has this work so these are the main romantic features of his work and now i shall open this session for discussions observation if you have any observation observation you can make so my first first question will be related to the romantic elements in this essay second aspect of analysis that i have done romantic criticism so aspects of romantic criticism you can also refer to the way shakespeare was read hamlet was read by the new classical critics in order to appreciate romantic criticism of shakespeare and the third aspect is general prose style as because this is a literary essay a critical essay we have the language of literature that is there in this essay so this can be independently read as an informal essay as a personal essay and definitely as a periodical essay the orality of the essay the conversational idiom the vocabulary of ordinary conversation all this make this essay quite ordinary and simple for our understanding so these are the main aspects of the essay that we have discussed so you can make some observation related to this yes any observation thank you for your attendance so so we meet again with some next topic